And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason where they meet. I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper here on Mother Angelica Way where it all began back in 1981. And of course, you're an important part of this program. So please email us your questions to spitzersuniverse at ew10.com. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites, the Magic Center one, the Credible Catholic one, and the PurposefulUniverse.com as well, all designed for different interests. And of course, Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on the EW10 On Demand page and on our EW10 YouTube channel. And while you're on our On Demand page, be sure to check out a very popular program, tough program, but it needed to be made, the transgender movement, what Catholics need to know. Host Mary Hassan explains this important issue now confronting families throughout the nation and basically around the world. So check that out. Tonight's topic this afternoon as well is envy, uh, something unfortunately all of us can relate to from Father's book, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives, naturally available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. I assume you have one. You should give one to somebody else in your family. You get it out of our catalog, Perfect for Christmas, or Father's new book as well. And of course, our book of the month for December is the prayer book for tired parents, Practical Ways to Grow in Love for <laughs> God and Get Your Family to Heaven by our own Debbie Cowden, along with her husband, David. Wonderful book that's uh, selling quite well. And of course, uh, everybody who's a parent knows what it's like to be tired. And with that, we're going to turn to someone who's never tired, who's always relentless. Oh, the one yeah, and only right. Father Spitzer, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. You want to kick everything off with a prayer? That'd be great, Father. You, you bet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. The blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now. Doug, myself, our whole audience this day so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, and St. Ambrose, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And a blessed Advent <coughs> to all of our audience. And people could probably hear a little bit of a rasp in your voice along with that cough because you uh, had a yeah. little uh, touch <laughs> of uh, the COVID, right, uh, recently. The old COVID, yes, indeed. But uh, it was a five-day extravaganza and a uh, light flu and then just really disappeared. Right. So uh, the only thing left over is the rasp. And okay. so um, uh, that, too, I'm sure shall pass. But I have been okay. giving so many speeches in the last two days that I've probably done nothing but irritate oh, my voice okay. box. So. <laughs> uh, cashing in again right before Christmas. I understand. Cashing in. <laughs> <laughs> so at least you're lucky that you're not planning on uh, seeking assisted suicide in Germany because of Life News oh. indicates that German euthanasia clinics now require COVID vaccinations for parents, for patients seeking assisted suicide. So they want to make sure you're perfectly healthy <laughs> before they help kill you. Apparently, that's, yeah. a, that's a story. Yeah. Yeah. Only in the world we live in uh, today. And along with that, that's another right. one. Self-esteem uh, expert committed right. suicide. Yeah. And, and, okay. and related to that, out of Manitoba, uh, Medically assisted deaths could save millions in health care spending. That's a report that came out across <laughs> Canada. Uh, so uh, it's a couple yeah, of years ago, yeah. but it, it's indicative of, of where we're going. Uh, you know, oh, medically yeah. assisted. Oh, you know, yeah. That's the whole thing. How much money can we save? I mean, you probably heard this story about, the, I think the, I think it might have been a vet, veteran, but a woman up in Canada, I think, who had requested to get yeah. a stair climber or something for her house so she could get up. And I yeah. said, well, we're not going to do that. But we're happy to help put you down if you'd like to take a veil yeah. of uh, assisted <laughs> yeah. suicide. That's you know? right. Uh, so. Yeah, the poor woman gets the thing of, yeah, we can't give you a stair climber, but we can give you assisted suicide. That's she goes, right. You're... Assisted suicide? I'm not even terminal. Right. Yeah. Well, you'll never have to worry about climbing yeah. those stairs again, that's for sure, right? I mean, uh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, no, the Canadians are uh, they're out there just waving the uh, the suicide flag to everybody. Yes. Uh, yeah, boy, I'll tell you what an advanced uh, culture they have. Right. right. <laughs> isn't it amazing, or is it amazing? We always talk about the slippery slope and. We're on a downhill slope. Yeah. How quickly, once it shifts a little bit, how fast it all follows, how quickly the dominoes fall. Absolutely. Fall, you know? The slippery slope is no myth at all. Right. It is, you know, uh, I've been talking about it for years in this program. It's just going to keep coming. Uh, the, uh, the, the Hemlock Society now oh, euphemistically, right. you know, called a variety of different things like, right. you know, physicians against pain and so forth. Right. Um, but the, uh, uh, all of these uh, different movements are just so aggressive in bringing the next step along. And if people accept the first step, that assisted suicide is okay, mm -hmm. uh, then of course the rest is kind of easy. We're just talking about gradations of how far do you want to go. I mean, is, uh, is your suicide, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, a little bit uh, better than uh, a stair stepper? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. It's so, cheaper. I mean, it's the, the, cheaper. The, yeah, sure. Yeah, the disability rights people, of course, are panicked about it right. because. The dignity of those who have disabilities is being challenged with each passing day, mm -hmm. and you have the perennial problem of uh, you know one person's option becomes another person's uh, duty to die. Mm -hmm. Obligation. And now mm -hmm. you know again you know oh yeah sure before uh, before you had assisted suicide, people were not being pressured to die. Right. Now that you have this so-called freedom for other people. The insurance companies are pressuring it, physicians are pressuring it, family members are pressuring it, and people who never had any such pressures before are, are now you know, feeling this burden to die. What wisdom we have manifested, what new freedoms we have brought into the culture with this new cultural panacea for everything. Right. The cure is kill yourself. I mean, it, it's just so ironic, it, it's so wrong, it's so pressuring to elderly people. I mean, now we've got pressure on people who don't even have terminal cases. Right. You just want a stair stepper. Right. You know, I mean, right. what the heck? You know, it's, it's like yeah, a, something to get up the know, stairs uh, there, you know, one of those little it's something to get little right, wheel, that little, little chair thing, right, yeah, that, that goes up the up. stairs. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. it, it it is amazing yeah. how uh, how it happens and how quickly it happens. I'm I'm sure Dr. Yeah. Mengele would be very proud of uh, oh, what's yeah. going on I'm today. Oh yeah, I'm sure he would. You know, they always yes. talked about yes, how they the were the logic of compassion. Right, it was so insulting, <laughs> and how could the medical community be so co-opted by the Nazis? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. When we see yeah. it, same well, thing. Well, they're being co-opted uh, once again, right. but it's all about compassion. I was in a in a debate once with a uh, fellow who was a Unitarian minister mm -hmm. uh, about this, and he said, "Well, Bob, you know, we <laughs> both agree on the same thing." I said, "Well, Ralph, what <laughs> is that?" And he goes, "Love. We both believe in love." And I said, "Well, Ralph." <laughs> It all depends on what you mean by love. And we mean very different things. Right. If you mean it were true compassion of suffering with somebody, trying to give somebody ultimate dignity in the last days of their life, and trying to give them a value so that they can impart what really matters in life, their, their wisdom, mm -hmm. their faith, and their love, and their forgiveness, and to ask forgiveness of others and healing from others in the times of their, their, their last moments. If that's what you're talking about is love, well, then we agree on it. But if you mean by love just giving somebody the little potion to die, right. I don't mean that at all. And so, of course, that's the... Uh, you know that's where we stand right now, and and I and unfortunately I think um, this uh, definitional problem uh, is huge. I think the definition of compassion is huge, and is being propaganda right. propagandistically mm -hmm. euphemized, and no pun intended, right. um, uh, to uh, to um, manufacture euthanasia, and so um, it's um, it's pretty pretty much. Uh, uh, a bad situation, but right. people have to have wisdom and know the, the wisdom of the Catholic Church in its teaching and that that is true compassion, 
That's the compassion of Jesus Christ, not this false compassion right. that opens the door to so many people, new victims of the pressure, the burden to die, that never experienced such a burden before. Right, and speaking of false compassion, interesting story uh, from about yeah. a week or so ago. Uh, New York Times finally admits that gender-affirming care may be dangerous. Yep. Uh, they published a lengthy story admitting that gender-affirming care could be harmful to kids. The article, They Pause Puberty, But Is There a Cost, is the name of it, acknowledges that scientific evidence trumps that of the woke media that wants to believe there's no problem. They talk about 300,000 adolescents between the ages of 13 and 17 are concerned with medical professionals about the consequences the drugs will have on them. And uh, the questions, as yeah. we've talked about mm -hmm. on the show, are fuel, fueling concerns in Europe where things have been stopped. And the authors of the article point, right. point out yeah. that uh, an increasing amount of minors are regretting their choices to have life-altering procedures done and take medication. They go on to note that uh, how woke activists pressured authorities into approving medication and surgeries before doctors were even able to understand them. What a surprise. Yeah, no, I mean, I can't believe this is coming from the New York Times, but it is so true. The New York Times is right on the marker. I mean, we've been talking about this for well over a year. Doctors Mayer and McHugh exposed this. Those are the two professors from Johns Hopkins University who exposed this about uh, two and a half, three years ago. And, of course, um, just made known those studies, you know, where you have a, a 20 times 20 times increase from 1.6% uh, suicide rate uh, that goes up to about a 34% uh, suicide rate um, in, in the, uh, you know, 1.6% overall in the, in the general community. And then in the transgender 10 years after surgery community, it, it goes up to uh, nearly 34% suicides in that community. I mean, it's just mind boggling mm -hmm. uh, what is going on. And that's not just in the United States, that's in Sweden, that's in Britain. That's why the British have completely reversed track. They're doing a wait and see, but still right here in the United States, gender-affirming therapy. But what gender-affirming therapy means is you start giving these pre-adolescents pre these um, very strong uh, drugs to inhibit uh, their natural maturation process and even to reverse it in some cases. Uh, these are hormones and other kinds of things. They get them going when they're pre-adolescents so that when the, the time comes, that nice $100,000 surgery comes right down the pike and, uh, you know, it's uh, being nicely paid for until, of course, the regret happens mm -hmm. and it, now it's getting not just 10 years after the surgery you can see from all of these adolescents who are complaining in Europe right and now it's beginning to happen in the United States story after story is coming out now and um, if, uh, right. people are trying to detransition that, uh, that is to say to to reverse what they've right. done but if you actually went ahead with the sexual reassignment surgery there's no reversing it really the physical damage is permanent and, and so uh, again you're not going to solve the anxieties that lead to the thought that there is really um, a need for um, a, a sexual reassignment surgery. So if somebody, uh, you know, a pre-adolescent feels that anxiety within him, the anxiety is more likely caused by anxieties in the household, by physical or sexual abuse uh, when a minor, uh, by having encouragement um, by parents and others mm -hmm. uh, to, to transition or um, other kinds of things like latent homosexual desires. Right. Now, this wraps you up in a big ball of different kinds of, of causes of anxieties, but what it all comes down to, it feels like being uh, a man being trapped in a woman's body or a woman being trapped in a man's body. But at the end of the day, there's no genetic or biological indication that any such kind of physical cause exists. So at the end of the day, I think the British have taken the smart track, they have reversed track, and the reason that they're reversing track is because it is doing harm. Right. It's not just doing irreversible physical harm, though certainly that, the detransitioners uh, now know that, but it's doing immense emotional, psychiatric, uh, psychological harm. And so what's happening at the end of the day is 
these huge increase in depression, anxiety, and suicides, 20 times, wow. uh, you know, the, the increase. Uh, that has to, you know, this has been, you know, now exposed. And the New York Times is, I am so happy right. that they are so concerned with the truth and the health of these young people that they're bringing well, this it, out, even yes. though... The, Gets yeah. to the point where it's almost they can't avoid it because it's it's just they're in a fit. Yeah. I wonder whether, unfortunately, on one level, the reason uh, they're willing to take the step back in the UK with the NHS is because it's not necessarily a for-profit medical system. Where in the United States, obviously, yeah. there's a lot of positive aspects of that because we get research and things like that, but there also may be more of an imperative to go ahead than there may be in the UK because the benefit of the doctors isn't, the reward for them isn't as high. Yeah, well, 100,000 right. bucks for a surgery, right. uh, that's not a bad deal. And right. so, um, exactly. you know, I'm... That's not yeah, what they're getting I mean, over so there, so... I think, yeah, 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 oh, yeah absolutely. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it's yeah, just that's one right. of, Here's another story that, that came out. Um, that uh, a report, and I thought this was interesting because of so much of your work, religious nuns, meaning N-O-N-E-S, skew heavily democratic and pro-abortion. Some 29% of U.S. adults identify as nuns, meaning atheist, agnostic, or nothing uh -huh. in particular, a jump of nearly 10 percentage points over the past 10 years in the recent midterms. Approximately 22% of voters were nuns, or roughly the same number who represent Catholics, and 60% of religiously yeah. unaffiliated Democratic voters assert that abortion should be basically legal, uh, whereas just 40% of Democrats voted affiliated with Christian traditions say the same thing. So y your interest in trying to reach out to these people, not just for their own salvation, yeah. but for the good of the good of the culture, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, what, what's not being said uh, in those statistics yet, but, I mean, that's, that's true. I mean, uh, you can see, uh, for example, that, um, you know, if you're dealing with homosexual lifestyle, for example, uh, there is, you know, you're going to have twice the likelihood of being atheistic, mm -hmm. right? Or if you um, are a believer in abortion, uh, you know, the, the likelihood that you are a nun is pretty significant, uh, right? A nun means no religious affiliation, um, you know, either by apathy, agnosticism, or atheism. It doesn't really break it down. But the main thing is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there is correlation between non-religious affiliation, between rejection of what you might call a traditional Christian morality regarding abortion or, or regarding, you know, homosexual lives, uh, regarding transgender, transgenderism, whatever the case may be. There's an association between that and there's certainly a big, huge association uh, with um, uh, increased, hugely increased levels of depression, anxiety, suicides, et cetera, a decrease in prayer life, a decrease in religious practice, et cetera. So right. all of these things are part of, and parcel, uh, you know, of, you know, this movement that's going on in the United States. And you say, well, what is the cause? I mean, it's almost like reciprocal causes going on simultaneously. So you basically have, you know, first of all, you have the problem of, you know, secular challenges at a time, you know, when, when young scientists are now 66 percent declaring themselves to be theists, according mm -hmm. to the uh, Pew survey a while back, um, you know, that's a young scientist, but 51 percent overall mm -hmm. claiming to be um, theists or believers in a higher transcendent power. So you've got, um, you know, the majority of scientists are, are religious, are either uh, theistic, that's to say believers in God uh, or a higher religious power. And then a, a super majority of young scientists are, there's more evidence today for God, a creator, an intelligent creator, a soul from science than ever before, for sure, of life after death by scientific uh, studies than ever before, for sure. And at the same time, somehow, uh, you know, with the social media, the new media, et cetera, et cetera, that's going on, what you see is still they are pushing aggressively non-religious uh, affiliation mm -hmm. to our young people. I was just doing a talk uh, with a couple of hundred youngsters, uh, you know, confirmation mm -hmm. uh, youngsters yesterday, you know, and, and, um, 
and uh, it's just amazing. You know, their questions were good, but they center on this faith and science thing, and we just got to get the right. truth out. So I keep saying, screaming, you know, go to modulacenter.com, right. please go to the seven essential modules, please watch them, you get the facts. But the point um, uh, that's, that's there is, you know, you say, well, wait, what's the cause? The cause is aggressive pushing of non-religious affiliation, aggressive pushing of autonomous freedom as the highest value, aggressive pushing of sexual license as the most important manifestation of the autonomous freedom, which is the highest value, and a rejection as a consequence of those three. You've got to reject Christian uh, um, you know, norms of, of behavior and then accuse them of being non-open and non-tolerant when in point of fact nobody's criticizing or judging the individual people in question. It's not a toleration issue. It's just simply warning people of the horrible consequences of what this lifestyle does in terms of depression, anxiety, and, and uh, substance abuse, um, uh, suicidal contemplation, suicide, antisocial aggressivity, et cetera, et cetera. The correlations are in. Mm -hmm. We can see that these lifestyles are horrible for emotional health, relational health, marital health, and above all, spiritual health. And yet, somehow, you know, every time somebody points this out, trying to help out in the culture, right. because that true compassion is based on truth, Right? You, you got to know the whole truth or else your judgments are going to be wrong. And so if you try and point this out, you know, these lifestyles are not too uh, healthy <laughs> relationally, spiritually, or emotionally. You try and point those out, you're a judgmental person. You're try you should be canceled. You should be foreclosed right. on because you are trying to deprive people of their rights and you're making a judgment against them. I'm not making a judgment against anybody. I'm making a judgment against the lifestyle and that lifestyle or that set of behaviors or that uh, transition of, 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 of uh, sexual um, assignment and so forth and so on that that is the problem it's the actual uh, uh, lifestyle or behavior itself that needs to be fully understood and if people fully understood it and they didn't listen to the propaganda that is put out by the secular culture which is not telling the whole truth but only a partial truth mm -hmm. at the end of the day I think people would come around to seeing that the truth of Jesus Christ the moral good of Jesus Christ is what is going to be good for them not just spiritually, but emotionally, relationally, and maritally. Absolutely. And that really, I, I think, right. you, you know, we got the secular statistics and studies to back right. that up. Right, but you, you have to be open to them. And you have to hear about them yeah. and not have yeah. them be buried. Sort of yeah. like, at least with the transgenderism, yeah. some of that's starting to come out and go mainstream. One last thing, kind of a little yeah. kicker before we go to some questions. Uh, there was a yeah. story recently an NBA coach uh, from the Boston Celtics, I don't know if you heard this story, Joe Mazzula, no. was uh, asked during a press conference, I guess he was uh, at the game, I don't know if they were playing in London or where they were, but uh, apparently Prince William and uh -huh. Princess Kate, the Prince and Princess of Wales were there, and a reporter asked him, did, yeah. did you get a chance to meet with the royal family, and if not, what was like having them there? And Mazzula answers, you mean Jesus, Mary, and Joseph? And the reporter laughs and responds, <laughs> The Prince and Princess of Wales, he said, well, I'm only familiar with one royal family. I don't really know too much about them. And it goes on to say that Missoula is a devout <laughs> Catholic and a husband and father of two. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it was, if you see the, it. the video, is pretty <laughs> funny <laughs> the way he just kind of, he says it uh, totally seriously. So anyway, but uh, yeah, let's get to yeah. some, oh, uh, no. with, with that and being with said. tongue buried deeply in cheek. Yeah. Right, absolutely. <laughs> we turn to... Uh, some uh, questions from our viewers or statements. Dear Father Spitzer, I love your show. I always learn something. What is the best way to go to heaven? That's what Stan wants to know. Well, Stan, you know, I think the big three pillars that the Catholic Church uh, has, you know, talked about is number one, the Holy Eucharist, receiving the Holy Eucharist 
lovingly, respectfully, of course, we want to do it worthily. Um, so, you know, and asking for the four graces mm -hmm. of the Holy Eucharist. Ask not only um, uh, for, you know, for, uh, um, you know, the grace of transformation, but ask first and foremost that you might be protected mm -hmm. from the evil spirit. Ask uh, also that through this great sacrament, you might be transformed in the heart of Christ. Ask, too, for forgiveness from your venial sins and healing from your sins. And ask, too, um, that you might have that peace and that hope which is beyond all understanding. So um, if, if we put all those things together and ask for those things, that's the number one path. Receive the Holy Eucharist lovingly. Know who that is, the real presence of Jesus who is loving you back. Know that and ask for those four graces. Number two, second thing the church tells us pray every single day you don't have to be right um, Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. what you need to do though is what's the two most significant things of prayer number one every day and so even if it's just 10 minutes every day then specify a time for yourself that you most of the time you can make and set it aside and just be faithful to it and just do it. You know, it, you know, you can do just some decades of the rosary so that you're connecting with the Lord. Uh, just remember, as you're saying those prayers, just keep in mind that this is the Blessed Virgin Mary here. She's listening to you. She's there watching you, right? Connect with her every time you say, Hail Mary, full of grace. Holy Mary, Mother of God, right? When you say, Our Father who art in heaven, connect with him. Oh, my Jesus, forgive it. Connect with him, right? Come, Holy Spirit, connect with him. But, I mean, you could just do a couple of mm -hmm. um, uh, decades of the rosary. You could maybe get a nice uh, a prayer book with uh, some modern prayers in it. You could get a day-by-day, day, right, the Notre Dame prayer book for students. And you could mark out your 25 favorite prayers and mm -hmm. do, you know, five of those every day. Uh, just uh, some common prayers, some prayers for forgiveness, etc. Or you could do a little bit of Lectio Divina on the readings of the day. All you need to do is just go to usccb.org. That's the, um, the um, you know website for the right. bishops, right. At United States Council of Catholic Bishops. usccb.org. Hit it right comes up right away readings mm -hmm. and just click on readings and there are the readings for the day free of charge. Just sit there and you can do a little Lectio Divina on those readings. You don't have to get fancy. Don't get fancy. Mm -hmm. Just just make sure you're doing that every day and that when you're praying the scripture or you're praying the rosary or you're praying those common prayers, all you need to do is, is just connect with the Lord. So that's the second thing is that daily prayer. The third thing, I don't have to tell you how important it is, the sacrament of reconciliation. The, I mean, you got to do that. I, I would say, you know, at least every other month, mm -hmm. if you can do it six times a year, it's great. But surely during Advent, surely during Lent, surely around Pentecost, surely around, uh, you know, the end of the summer, those four times, you know, so that you're quarterly, seasonally kind of getting to that, uh, to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, it's so powerful. The graces are so powerful in that sacrament. I mean, it, certainly the devil hates it more than anything else in the whole wide world, breaks his grip over you, and, and of course protects you uh, from the evil spirit with the power of the Holy Spirit that's mm -hmm. coursing through. It gives you absolution, definitive absolution for your sins. And, and furthermore, of course, it gives you, you know, that turnaround consolation that people get, you know, that lightheartedness that John Henry Newman talks about, right? The uh, or Saint John Henry Newman now mm -hmm. uh, talks about, and so you know, you look at the uh, segment of reconciliation. It's just a font of grace. But if you can do it every other month, great. If you can just do it, you know, Advent, Lent. Pentecost and the end of the summer, great too. Okay, start, but you put it into your life. Build those three pillars there. Commit yourself to the three pillars. Don't let it go. And if you can do a little extra, right, if you can do maybe a daily mass or two, start in there. Every time you do this, 
what I guarantee you'll notice is that you'll have a little less emptiness, a little less alienation, a little less loneliness, a little less dread and guilt on that cosmic level, right? That there's going to be a little more peace beyond all understanding, a little more hope beyond all understanding is going to start a l much more serenity and security about yourself before God and your eternity, a be much better sense of dignity about your life, about your purpose in life, of being a high purpose in life. You're going to get all these benefits, just those three pillars. Right. You start working on those or put in a little extra with some extra masses or a little extra confession time or maybe move the prayer up from 10 minutes to 15 15 right. minutes a day. Don't go too much too fast. Right, you don't want to do, do that. Then you get discouraged. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. But I rely just, on the I rely yeah. on the Spitzerian prayer. Lord, help me. That's the one I remember. Yep. And we're gonna. With that said, I'm gonna take a break here. We're speaking with Father Spitzer. Absolutely. Much more of your questions straight ahead. Stay with us. so much for staying with us right here in Father Spitzer's universe where it's always busy. Our topic, Envy, from Father's book, of course, uh, Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. And of course, we're with Father and we're going through some of your questions. Here's a, a really interesting one, Father. Uh, we'll I'll take a little time. Dear Father Spitzer, totally awesome show on trans kids. In the past, hospitals did not do these gender affirming surgeries because studies suggested that 80% of kids feel gender dysphoria as part of maturing. I was one of those kids. I hated dresses, I liked toy guns, didn't play with dolls, much to the worry of my mother. I wanted to grow up to be a male, but as an adult, I fell in love with a wonderful man. We were married for 54 years until he passed away in the year 2020. I totally loved motherhood, having a son, and now grandkids, I would not have had it any other way. I'm 78 years old and I always love your show. But the aforementioned show was especially good. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to mention thank you, Sue. And also, uh, oh. you know, to remind people about the program, the on-demand program, the transgender movement, what Catholics need to know uh, is available on demand for free uh, if you go there and check that out. So if you know anybody who needs to get up to date on what's going on, that would be great as well. Go ahead, Father. No, I'm just going to say, uh, no, right on. And uh, thank you very much, Sue. And I, I really appreciate it. I have to say, <clears throat> when I, um, you know, uh, talk about these things, I, <clears throat> I often hear from people the very same testimony that you just gave to me. But, um, you know, there's a wonderful article out there by uh, Marin McHugh that I was just mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an article of the two professors from uh, Johns Hopkins University, and that's basically the statistic they talk about. Eighty percent of kids going through cross-gender confusion mm -hmm. will just go back to their biological sex after a, you know a, a, you know a year or so uh, after they've gotten to adolescence they they suddenly see um, you know that they um, they really uh, do respond to the uh, uh, as it were the biological mm -hmm. tendencies that they have and um, and they grow up to be very happy women uh, or men as the case may be um, and uh, that they don't need, right. not only do they not need a trans, uh, gender, trans, uh, a sexual transition, right. they basically, you know, are so happy they didn't go through with it and didn't live in our time when they would have been encouraged to go with, uh, through right. with it, uh, right. at least in a lot of cases. Let me ask you, do you know uh, what the percentage, is it more women uh, transing to men or men transitioning to women, do we know? I'm not sure of the statistic, but I would probably say it's 50-50. Okay. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously, the people who are much more 
vocal about it uh, previously were men mm -hmm. uh, who wanted to transition to um, to women, um, and uh, of course that was in the news all the time, or right, you right. know was certainly there in the public domain. But um, now I would say you know there are a lot of women who want to transition, right. Right. Um, and uh, they are. Uh, uh, the trouble, of course, is is that um, when they get those uh, hormones pre-adolescent, you know they're given right. these powerful hormones. You know, I, I just think it's 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 not only unethical, it's sinful. Absolutely. I, you know, it's it's doing so much harm to these kids. They don't even have a developed frontal cortex. You know, where you know all the judgments are made. What in the world are we thinking about? Well, but you they, know, can have, to, to they, they can have an abortion. It's not really a problem. You know, that, that yeah, yeah, well, right, exactly. They can't get an they aspirin. Know what they're you know, doing at the high school, but they can get the abortion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question, dear Father yeah, Spitzer, yeah. I'm a cradle Catholic, trying to convince members of my family they return to the church. You base the moral decline in society on the secular statistical study showing a dramatic increase in anxiety, depression, suicide rates, as you just did earlier in the show. Is there right. any evidence in those studies that show the opposite statistical data for individuals who live by the moral teachings of the church? Richard. Yes, uh, Richard, um, there are statistics that show that some people, uh, you know, who are living a religious life still continue to have um, uh, anxieties and depression and so forth and so on. So there are a number of people living, uh, you know, a life, you know, religious life that do have uh, depression and anxiety and, and things of that nature. What that is uh, coming from, though, is generally not their religion. What it, that's coming from are three different possibilities. Number one, there could be a trauma in the background, sexual or physical mm -hmm. abuse or something of that nature, something that was really shocking, debilitating, uh, you know, a moment of grief, a, a parent dying or something of that nature. Uh, so that's one possibility uh, that causes depression. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, of course, that um, uh, in the case of divorce even, it doesn't have to be the death of a parent, but divorce can also lead, um, uh, to, you know, uh, to depression, especially among uh, children who are ra uh, rather young and experiencing uh, the, the divorce. Uh, there's also um, a second possibility um, for that, and of course that's kind of a biological possibility. Um, and uh, the biological possibility has two, um, uh, you know, sub-steps. Uh, one of them is just some kind of uh, hormonal change that actually interacted with brain chemistry in a very, very negative way. So um, certain kinds of chemicals um, uh, in, in the brain are, are affected that uh, do cause uh, some emotional uh, instability mm -hmm. uh, in, in people, and that happens oftentimes when adolescence uh, occurs, and it, it really happens because of hormonal change. Okay. But there's also, of course, um, some people are born into the world uh, with those chemical imbalances, and that's unfortunate, but it does happen. And of course, then there's the, the, the third one, and that's the basic sociopath, mm -hmm. uh, who, who, of course, the underlying depression in it, but they're unloved. Uh, as children, mm -hmm. simply unloved, uh, yeah. uncared for, ignored, et cetera, et cetera. And that not only leads to depression, but it oftentimes leads to that uh, sociopathic uh, kind of um, uh, response. Right. So um, those are natural things. They're not, I mean, you could have religion, um, but still those natural things are causing the depression and so, um, yeah, sometimes religion will mitigate it, though. Right. Um, and uh, if you don't have religion, you're surely not going to get religious mitigation. Absolutely. But one thing right. is sure. If you compare the two populations, when you take out, uh, you know, um, these uh, physical uh, predispositions or traumatic predispositions, et cetera, that I was just talking about, if you remove that stuff and just compare the two populations, there's no question that non-religiously affiliated people have significantly higher uh, suicide rates, depression, anxiety, antisocial aggressivity, familial tensions and substance abuse, okay. and suicides themselves. Okay. So that, that is um, pretty certain. Okay, we got, uh, we're going to do this next question and maybe another one, and then we'll okay. get to the topic. Dear Father Spitzer, how did Jesus deal okay. with... How did D Jesus deal with stress in his everyday life 
and that of his approaching passion. How can I apply his example to my life, Tony? Well, Tony, we know um, for a fact that Jesus would always try to get away to the mountain to pray or find a place at, in the evening, right, to pray. Uh, when just before he was dealing with the passion, what was he doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was praying. And so prayer is a very common way in which that occurs. I wrote a book called uh, The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming uh, Suffering Through Faith. And I have a bunch of spontaneous prayers in that book. Uh, that are very, very good. Uh, but you could also go to my website, modustcenter.com, and just go to a free, um, you know, uh, 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 website article called Getting Started on Prayer. Mm -hmm. Getting Started on Prayer. And you can see those spontaneous prayers that are there. They are so handy, like push back the foreboding, mm -hmm. Lord, make good come out of um, uh, whatever harm I might have caused, or Lord, make some good come out of this suffering, some good for me, for the people around me, for the church, for the kingdom of God. M optimize good uh, from the suffering, or Lord, I give up, you take care of it, or Lord, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, or Doug Keck's favorite prayer, Lord, help. There you and of go. course, all of these <laughs> prayers are, uh, right, all of them are really, really good. Push back the foreboding is really important because what comes with stress, that darkness, that foreboding, that kind of like, uh, you know, there's an right. emptiness and a darkness out there. And just tell the Lord, Lord, push back the foreboding and just push it back and just say, Lord, push back whatever's causing this foreboding. Help me to put right. my trust in you. Okay. So I think the prayer solution is the best one. Absolutely. It seemed to be what our Lord relied on all the time. Uh, so yep. uh, as we transition into uh, uh, Satan's tactics, um, you know, dear Father Spitzer, is it possible that vanity can subconsciously drive us to improve ourselves? Would it help us to correct our flaws, flaws or would we be unable to control it then? And of course, we were talking about vanity earlier uh, on the program in the last month or so. Yeah, well, that old oh, Ben. Here's the main, main thing: is, is that uh, well, vanity does and could subconsciously um, uh, have those effects. Um, but the main thing to remember is it'll have an, a, a good effect on in terms of your behavior your external behavior because right that's what vanity drives toward admiration from other people so of course i might say well i might have um you know um uh, let's say a flaw uh, I, of of lust or something the sin of lust and but i'm not going to do those behaviors because mm -hmm. boy you know i don't want to get caught externally but still in my heart Mm -hmm. Right, it's not curing that flaw. It's it, you know, vanity's not doing anything. It's just making, it's curbing my external. Or you could say, I got a terrible, uh, s you know, sin of greed. Right, I just, I, I just every material possession I see, I want one, or whatever. I got to have more money, or whatever it may be. And and the point is pretty clear, right? That you know, you could your vanity might say to you, oh. You know, you're going to look like a real greedy guy, and people are not going to trust you. And if they don't trust you, your sales are going to really go down or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the point is, yes, but that only changes the external behavior, not the inner heart. And so I would say don't use the vanity solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, take it for what it's worth. But, boy, if you let the vanity solution right. out of the bag and you let it go too far, then it will control you. Vanity is so strong in this culture, and vanity is encouraged so much in this culture. I'm telling you, it, it, it could just overtake you and kill you overnight. I mean, Norma Desmond ain't nothing compared <laughs> right. to what could happen to you. And all those great examples in C.S. Lewis's book, um, you know, the... Um, uh, you know, the bus ride, um, uh, the great you know, divorce. from uh, hell to heaven, uh, the great divorce. Right. So um, in, in any case, uh, I would say be careful. If you really want to get to the uh, flaws, though, if you really want a cure for the interior heart, it's go back to prayer, go back to, you know, um, Jesus Christ, go back to that contemplative life right. where you begin to fall more and more in love not, with the person of Jesus, but also 
who he right. is, his right. character, what makes him to be lovable, right. the lovability right. of our Lord and our Blessed Mother. I mean, their chastity becomes not only um, uh, beautiful, but lovely. Right. And, and, and so you begin to, to love it, that chastity in them. Right. And then, of course, if you love chastity, then you look and you go, well, I don't, you know, lust is not that great. Right. You know, and you feel the contrast. You feel the darkness of that lust interiorly. And right. that's where it st starts, you make, start making progress right. when you get that gestalt, right? That, that right. you know, I feel that contrast, that darkness, and I don't like it. And so even the pleasure that comes from thinking about something lustful, but then you think, oh, I'm beginning to feel this darkness at the same time associated with it because it is offending my Lord who I love. Then you're now well, you making the interior right. progress. Well, you were talking about it with, it yeah, with the ahead. vanity in the sense of the outward sign, kind of like the Pharisees who obviously yeah. did good yeah. things in different ways and felt very proud of themselves about doing it. But interiorly, yeah. they were they dead men's bones. Oh, yeah. Uh, right on, Doug. I mean, that's right on. That, that's exactly right. They're widening their phylacteries, but uh, basically dead men's bones on the inside. Okay. Perfect. So in, in your yeah. book on page 316, yeah, we were talking about the idea of envy. Um, and you say frequently yeah. envious individuals believe that they have been treated unfairly, whether it be by life, God, or others. Yep, that's right. And of course, it's that's the beginning part, you know. If life were truly fair, right, then I would have all those talents of that other fellow. Um, I deserve them. Or if life were really fair, I'd have just as much income potential as that other fellow. And so there's always this idea that, you know, some kind of diversity of talent is an injustice, an unfair thing, instead of just saying, well, it's just, you know, I've got some uh, gifts, he's got some gifts. Mm -hmm. If we make the most out of our gifts, though, we can do what? We can be good to our families, we can put some food on the mm -hmm. table, we can build up our church and the kingdom of God, we can uh, help out others and, 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 and make sure that we leave a, you know, a contributive legacy. We can do all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever set of talents you have, that's, you can do those things according to those talents. Mm -hmm. Now some people you know, who might not have all the intellectual skills of another person may choose to do it in this way. Some people who have rhetorical skill do it in this way. Some people who have athletic skills or, you know, I mean, just you know what beauty means in this culture. My gosh, if you have beauty, you can open doors anywhere. And, and if you can do that, I look at how much good you can do just by opening those doors for people. So, I mean, whatever talent or skill or, or gifts you've been given, we all have some and, and we all have our crosses. And, and you know, what we have to do is, is be satisfied right. uh, with what we have. And, in, and instead of making that horrible judgment, you know, right. I deserve that other guy's gifts. I should have that uh, challenging the creator up front, you know. Right. You should have given me this thing. But that little rat got him. And now I hate that little rat. And I got to do something to put right. him down because he's looking so smug these days. I think I'll just put him down or maybe do something worse, right? right? I'll try to undermine him or whatever. And that's why I use uh, Shakespeare's uh, Iago. Iago, you know, yeah, his, absolutely. Uh, right. the, yeah, and, and, and there. Othello there. Oh, yeah, he was just Yeah, terrible. like you say, how many, and, uh, was it know. four bodies in that? Five bodies? I forget the yeah. number off. Uh, how yeah, many five, people body actually... in the, uh, five body count. Right, yeah. Yeah, based on he, his, he, own, he... his own jealousy because somebody got promoted over him. I mean, that's where it all started, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, right. Absolutely. But it, yeah. it's, it's interesting, too, yeah. because with the envious, it, it, it's, it's not only not wanting, it's like this idea, if I can't have it, nobody will. Nobody can. I'm going to destroy. Uh, I want to make sure that you don't have it. It doesn't matter. Even if I don't get oh, yeah. it, you can't have it. Oh, yeah. And in the case, right, of Iago, uh, I mean, uh, of, uh, you know, um, 
uh, you know, um, uh, Iago, he, he, he yeah, wanted, yeah. in Othello, he wanted yeah. to get the, uh, uh, the promotion, and, and certainly uh, if he didn't get the promotion, uh, everybody who did get the promotion, they got to die. The guy who gave the promotion, namely Othello, he's got to die. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I got to really get even with Othello's uh, fiance too. Uh, mm -hmm. Just bring her into the equation. She's got to die. If I can't get the girl, uh, you know, ha have the girl, and the other guy gets the girl, then it's not just the guy who's got to die. The girl's got to die. Right, right. You know, and so you know, it's the, the envy sometimes has you know. No limits, and sometimes it doesn't have to be death. Right, this can but it's be incredibly terrible destructive. Down's terrible. Incredibly destructive. Oh yeah, right? destructive. And eats yeah, away people. Absolutely. And you also make the point that envy is distinct from jealousy. You say the former arises out of a perceived lack of benefit, the injustice that engenders hatred and retributive right. action. The latter generally arises out yeah. of a sense of losing someone who an individual believes should be loyal to him. Interesting. Explain. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, in this case, it's jealousy over a person, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there could be jealousy over goods, too. But, you know, jealousy basically does not go to the point of hatred mm -hmm. for the other. So uh, jealousy basically, you know, says, I, I should have had this, right? Um, or, I, I, you know, I deserve this in fairness. Um, but it doesn't go any further mm -hmm. when, you know, when you take the next step, when you say, you know, I, I want what you have and I then here's the next step. I hate you because you have it. Mm -hmm. You've just gone from jealousy. I want what you have. You know, I covet it to right. I hate you before because you have it. That's envy. And so uh, once you make that move to, you know, hatred, um, you know, for the other right. because they have the gift, and what's going to settle you down? I mean, you just, in, until you destroy somebody, you're never going to be happy. Well, you say here, envy is also distinct yeah. from covetedness, though not completely. Covetedness yeah. is associated more with greed, the desire to possess something. Yeah. Yep, that's right. And, uh, you know, greed is... Uh, uh, the desire to possess and uh, jealousy, of course, uh, or covetousness can be, uh, you know, just toward a good. Oftentimes, though, it's it's toward a person, you know, covet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting that the Bible breaks it up between coveting our neighbor's goods and coveting the neighbor's wife or spouse, mm -hmm. right? And so you, you, when you really look at that, um, you know, both covetings are bad, but coveting a person, you know, wanting that person or... Uh, that mm -hmm. is the kind of stuff that can lead to envy much more quickly uh, than merely having a, you know, a television right. set you want. But, right. you know, we, we've seen it in, you know, why did you kill that person? Well, he had those Adidas shoes I wanted. You go, right. you're kidding me. Right. Right. You killed him to get the Adidas shoes? No, because he had them and I couldn't afford them. Right. That's the thing. You look at that and you go, that's pure envy. Right. That's, that's uh, pure envy. And yeah. we see a lot of, yeah. unfortunately, in politics where there's envy's used as a, a motivation factor uh, to uh, you know, motivate groups. Now, what's interesting, too, on 317, you talk about the fact that many ancient philosophers and poets recognize the destructiveness of envy to both the agent and the yeah. intended victim. And I, I guess you have the Roman poet Ovid here. But that whole idea yeah. of how uh, he recognized how envy consumes herself, I guess, based on the poem, while she's attempting to yeah. annihil annihilate her victims whose joy and positive demeanor infuriate her, she will never be satisfied as, as, as she annihilates one victim. Yeah, that's right. I mean, she's, she's, she's annihilating all these people, but slowly but surely, she's annihilating herself. It's like Tolkien and the Silmarillion, you know, that the great sort of spider, mm -hmm. uh, you know, goddess, I guess you'd call it in the, in, you know, the Silmarils. I mean, she just basically uh, consumes so many people that, you know, she kind of blows up, you know, she, she destroys herself mm -hmm. in her consumptive fever. So, um, and, and, and that's what envy does. Right. I mean, there's, there's no, say, uh, you know, uh, sating it, you know, it's, it, you know, it, basically 
you know, you, 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 you just keep going and going and going and going until finally, of course, uh, you, you find yourself just a, a complete self, a ne negation. Mm -hmm. You've done so much destruction with your life. You're such a dark uh, person. You know, how many of the envious uh, basically wind up in the end, you know, horribly committing suicide? Uh, you know, it's, right. um, it happens all the time. Right, yeah. absolutely, so, absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and, and I'll make this statement just uh, on our way out the door. Uh, people can, uh, as yeah. a prefigurement for next week, envy figures quite prominently, you say, in the Bible and lies at the center of two important initial narratives yeah. in Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Cain and Abel. And that is what we will be yep. picking things up when we get together again next week. Father, so if you'd like to give us your blessing on the way out the door, that'd be great. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, oh, sorry, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Mm. And may the Lord of all peace, consolation, virtue, and wisdom send his spirit down upon you to inspire, guide, and protect you so that you truly might not only be able to live the virtues in your heart, live it in your life, but share it with others and lead others into the kingdom of uh, promise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well and rest that voice. We'll see you next week, and we'll hope to see you next week as well. Father Spitzer's books naturally and DVDs are available through our religious catalog. Next week, we'll continue talking about envy. And don't forget EW10's bookmark. I had a nice interview, uh, Women Made New, Reflections of Adversity, Transformation, and Healing by Christina Everett. So you can look for that. And also, Witness to Providence, the annual Mother Angelica Award, Monday, December 12th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Check the EWTN website for additional days and times throughout the week. Very exciting. We'll see who wins. So make sure you tune in. Well, you win every week with Father Spitzer in his universe. So we shall see you next time. Thanks.